I had the uh, dubious distinction of working for 21 years in the media industry. Why dubious? Because I now look back on the very idea of industrialising storytelling with a degree of discomfort. Uh, what I'm about to talk about is the potential that the internet has given us to take back our storytelling, to make sense of the world and share our storytelling with each other. But we haven't really made an awful lot of use of that yet. We've had the internet for roughly 30 years, the web for roughly 20, and still show an amazing propensity to use it to share photographs of cats with each other. <laughs> but it can be and should be used for much more important things. I heard the uh, management guru Peter Drucker speak many years ago, and he said that in a knowledge economy there are no such thing as conscripts, there are only volunteers. The trouble is we've trained our managers to manage conscripts. And especially as we move into an era with the automation of the workforce expanding into what would previously have been known as knowledge work, white collar workers, <clears throat> especially in the law or in uh, finance, many of the jobs that people going to universities like this would have aspired to may not be there in 10 years' time. So adding value will increasingly mean having opinions, having thoughts, being willing and able to share those thoughts. The other quote is from a book called The Clue Train, who managed to put their finger exactly on what the power of the internet was, and it is this globally distributed, near instant, person-to-person -person conversations. So the fact that it breaks down all sorts of geographical, political, and organizational barriers, the fact that it's near instant, challenges many who are professionally charged with telling stories. We can spread information and news faster than they can. You watch the news media trying to keep up with Twitter all the time. But the power of it is person to person. It's the fact that we're using it to connect with each other and to share our stories with each other and to use these platforms to build relationships because they are inherently social. You know, people still slightly dismissively sneer at some of the conversations that take place on Facebook or Twitter. But when we meet each other in real life, we do the same thing. We do all those sort of stroking conversations about where we went to school, where we're going on holiday, what our kids are doing. And that bonding is something we ought not to be afraid of. These tools are also with us 24 hours a day, seven days a week, um, wherever we go. And again, there are upsides and downsides to that. We need to learn how to protect ourselves from that degree of constant access to these technologies. But it also means that the lines between home and work, for instance, are becoming blurred. And increasingly, it's us who are having to manage those boundaries. You know, when I work with some companies, when they tell me that they have banned Facebook, I ask if they take people's mobile phones from them, because that's mostly how we access this sort of stuff. One company actually said, yes, we do. So they actually took people's phones from them as they came into the office in the mornings. Going back to the Peter Drucker quote about being conscripts. These are intimate devices. Because we're with, with them 24-7, we're with them. You know, the first thing I do in the mornings is wake up and reach out for my mobile phone. I keep it close to my heart or other parts of my anatomy that I care about. And these are intimate tools. They are personal tools. If either my manager or a marketer is going to get anywhere near my phone, they have to behave. They have to add value. They have to be useful to me. This may worry some of you, but I've been online so long for so much of the time that it now almost feels biological. My thought processes are so ingrained into blogging, which I've done for 15 years, where ideas will come, and come in and out of my skull. The synapses are inside, the synapses are outside, and it's pushing ideas out into networks that enhances them or grows them. By pointing to things, we collectively become smarter. And again, we're only sort of even now, 20, 30 years later, beginning to learn the power of pointing to things, being able to say, that's what we did the last time. This is the person who knows what they're talking about. Or even this is the film you should go and see in the cinema. And with tools like hashtags, we're able to achieve incredible collective power and sense making. You know, a friend of mine who invented the hashtag just takes enormous satisfaction when he watches things like Je suis Charlie happening, where all these people around the world who were able to 
access each other's thoughts through the hashtag, we're able to make collective sense. Or even the Scottish referendum, where this supposedly apathetic apolitical citizenry suddenly became very active, very animated, and caught Westminster and the conventional media on the hop. We have these tools at our disposal. The power of them lies in the ability to build networks and relationships, to identify people who will be useful to us, interesting to us, increasing the signal to noise in our relationships. So a lot of people say that somehow that I'm trying to take away the power or the effectiveness of face-to-face. -face. I'm not saying that at all. I find that with having spent some time and effort with these tools, I now have much higher value from my face-to-face -face time. I spend more time with really interesting people. I've also, frankly, had some very disappointing face-to-face -face experiences. And the power of being able to build a relationship with people I've never met before can sometimes be deceptively powerful. But the point is it gives us agency. And again, one of the slight frustrations is that thus far it's been seen as a communications channel. A sort of nice to have, warm and fuzzy, round the periphery of our lives type of a thing. But actually it's about the ability to do things, to be able to form groups that can do things, to be able to muster the resource to do things, either inside work or outside. And also the fact that we're beginning to observe the life around us. You know, Vint Cerf once said when he was asked whether he thought the internet was a good or a bad thing, he said it's just a thing. Whether it's good or bad depends on what we're doing with it. And if we don't like what we're doing with it, then it's a reflection of us as an individual, a society, or an organization, and that's what we have to deal with. And if we start to see some of the uglier side of our lives being exposed through these tools, that's what we have to deal with. And it comes down to our personal self-awareness our understanding of our agency in the world, our effect on the world, taking responsibility back for that effect, moving away from being passive consumers or passive employees and becoming agents in that world. And the first step in that is curiosity. One of the biggest frustrations I have with working with some of the big organizations I do is the lack of curiosity that the people that work in them exhibit. And in fact, I have people say to me sometimes, it's unreasonable of me to expect people to think especially at work. They don't go to work to think, they go to work to process stuff and be paid and stay safe. In order to grow out of that and to become more confident, we need to learn to trust ourselves and the confidence to say what we think in public in a very accountable space and trust each other. We need to find organizational ways of trusting our staff because they're all on the internet anyway, they're all on Facebook, they're all on Twitter increasingly having to try and work out whether they can or can't talk about work, what they can or can't say. So, so much of what we're not able to do at the moment is because of a lack of trust, and partly because of a lack of tolerance. You know, people sneer at people who make mistakes. Employers jump on staff who've said the wrong thing at the wrong time, or even just tolerance of each other. You know, watching flame wars or trolls on the internet and people feeling it's okay to beat each other up or just to be snide and aggressive towards each other. And there's a sort of gentleness about it as well, given that I said it was biological and it was intimate. I have a direct access, if I'm lucky, into people's heads. I have to treat that respectfully and not shout at them. And in fact, the power is in those quiet, small, observational notices that you send out to the world. A friend of mine once called it the intensity of the mundane, not the glamour of the special or the highly polished or the professional, but the little grit in the oyster that makes things so interesting. And the generosity to share that. You know, my own blog is called The Obvious because it was me re overcoming my reticence in stating the obvious. Because I thought, who am I to say that? People will laugh, people will disagree. And it takes genuinely an act of just generosity just to push these ideas out into the world in the hope that they will do somebody somewhere some good. And if you do, then you get a lot back. You know, the idea of giving out more than you expect to get back. So on Twitter, for instance, if I ask a question, I can expect to get an answer from thoughtful, intelligent people within 10 seconds of how to do something practically difficult that I wouldn't otherwise have any means to do. That happens because enough people follow me, enough people think well of me, and enough people take the time to answer the question. So that whole ebb and flow again of ideas and reciprocity. Adjusting our tone matters. A lot of formal conversations, a lot of formal business language, a lot of marketing language is very unnatural. 
and we have to learn, in effect, how to talk normally again. And it's difficult for people. I very often feel sorry for some of the chief execs that I work with who've been pushed into blogging, for instance, because the communications manager thought it would be a good idea. And it's a bit like watching your dad dancing at a disco. But you're proud of them for having a go, but you really wish they'd sit down. <laughs> Trying to recover that tone of voice, that human tone of voice, is difficult. And it's fueled by intent. Why am I writing this post? What do I expect the consequences to be? What am I giving to other people? What am I expecting from other people? The intent is the key driver. Now, the point of all this, as I said, just the last few slides, is that we will achieve an ability to make sense of our world if we do this. If we do this together, if we do it as many of us as possible, one of the things that gets me out of bed in the morning is the feeling that we need to get this as demographically representative as possible. The more people do it, the more generally it's accepted as a norm, the more likely it is to turn out well. And we're moving into a world that's much faster moving, much more complex, much less predictable than we're used to. And we're seeing our old ways of doing things begin to crumble under the strain. So I genuinely believe that we need to have these means of collective sense making if we're going to be able to walk into our future. And it's about sharing knowledge. Knowledge is power used to being holding on to it and only giving it out on special occasions to special people. In this new way of looking at the world, it's about giving it out all the time, as openly as possible, sharing it as widely as possible. And that does challenge the status quo. You know, somebody called me an organizational anarchist once and I thought, I'll have that as a t-shirt. I'm quite comfortable with that. In the sense that the original definition of anarchy was the ultimate in democracy. It was each person taking responsibility. You know, not libertarianism, but just taking responsibility individually and collectively for our world. And that is very challenging to those who are currently in charge of their environments. That comes with responsibility. You know, in some ways it's about growing up and about taking our place in the world and taking responsibility for our thoughts and the consequences of our thoughts and the consequence of sharing those thoughts out into the wider world. In its essence, that's what all of this is about. Uh, David Weinberger once said that what makes the internet hang together isn't technology, isn't internet protocol, it's the basic human desire to be connected. Connected to each other, connected to something worthwhile and sharing that sense of connectedness and power is what's behind the trivialities of the like button or getting comments on your blog post. And those are those little signs that somebody out there has heard us as we learn to find our voice again and hopefully change the world one conversation at a time. Thank you very much.